Hi there, my name is Michael Harris. Welcome to Falling Up Radio. I'm really excited that you're here today. We have an amazing guest today, which I'm going to introduce here in just a moment. I want to get to him as quick as we can, because he's got so much information to share with you today. Anyway, again, Falling Up Radio is really about finding ways to live your life the the way that you want, getting rid of the clutter, getting rid of the pain, getting rid of all those things that maybe it's no longer working in your life. Um, Where's my book? My book, Falling Down, Getting Up. You can get a free copy of this book here at the website, fallingupradio.com. If you're listening on one of the podcasts, iTunes or uh, Stitcher, just go to Falling Up Radio and follow the links and you'll get a free copy of the book. So with that being said, I don't want to take any more time uh, talking about my book or anything else. I want to talk about Dr. David Clark. I came across Dr. David Clark really just last year. I've been an explorer of really mind-body type thinking for a number of years, not only with my yoga practice, teaching yoga, but also having stumbled across Dr. Sarno's material in the mid-90s, which we, we Dr. Clark may mention that as well. But I want to introduce um, him to you. Dr. Clark, and I've got a long bio here. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read a portion of it. He, is, he, is, he was... He was clinical assistant professor or is of gastroenterology um, at OHSU, assistant director of Center for Ethics at OHSU. He teaches psychophysiologic disorder to internal medicine residents at OHSU. He is a faculty associate at Arizona State, and it goes on and on and on. He's a board certified gastroenterology and internal medicine, etc. And he wrote this incredible book that I've been reading almost done with it. It's called They Can't Find Anything Wrong. And this particularly fascinates me, not only because of past health issues, but seeing and hearing this from friends and students, et cetera, that go into the hospital and they can't really find anything wrong. Um, I've got another couple of paragraphs of um, Dr. Clark, uh, but I want to jump right in and... um, uh, Dr. Clark, I asked him beforehand, and I'm just going to call him Dave. So, Dave, hop on in. It's really great that you're here. Great to be with you, Michael. i uh, always happy to uh, spread information about this because uh, so many people are, are not aware that uh, issues like stress in your life, both past and present, can actually cause real physical symptoms. Uh, they're not in your head. They're actually physiologically based. So this is a, a new idea. Um, that's, um, it's been around for um, a long time, but it's new in terms of being able to uh, intervene in a way that's successful for patients. And you know, that's, that's the message we're trying to share. Yeah, it, it's a great message. And, um, you know, thinking that maybe part of my um, health conditions have been a result of stress, but oftentimes, you know, somebody will say, All right, I'll I'll hear it. Well, yeah, stress, yeah, that happened to Bob, but that's not true in my case. So how can somebody really understand whether or not stress is affecting them and causing various symptoms? Well, the only way to prove that stress is involved is to first uncover what the stresses are, and surprisingly often they're not obvious to the person. They may be struggling with things that, Uh, they're not consciously aware of. This happens most often with stresses from the past, uh, long-term impact of stress from when they were children, for example. Um, But to prove that the stress is involved, you have to first uncover it, then uh, almost always we can successfully uh, treat it, and then we see the person's symptoms begin to improve in response to that or even go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that happens uh, surprisingly often, but that's our, that's our diagnostic test. That's the way that we prove that somebody had um, a form of stress in their life that was responsible for the symptoms is actually by curing it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've watched some of your videos and they're fascinating as well as reading the book and talking about the symptoms and diagnosing somebody is that the diagnostic um, protocol, so, so to speak, for stress is different than the typical test and 
um, imagery and that. Can you explain how the, the diagnostics tests really go? Because it's not done very often, as I understand it. Yeah, most healthcare professionals, either on the medical side or the mental health side, have not really had any formal training uh, in how to do this. And so it, it tends to be a giant blind spot in the system. But we always start with looking for uh, an organ disease or a structural abnormality to explain the symptoms. We want to make sure the person isn't suffering from one of those. And, and nowadays, the diagnostic technology is powerful enough that if we don't find anything in that line, then it behooves us very much to go looking for stress in the person's life and see if we can find something there. C certainly, there are going to be a handful of people that there's, they've got a rare disease or they have a disease that we just simply don't have a diagnostic test for yet. But the vast majority of people that no explanation is found, you know, the classic, they can't find anything wrong kind of person. Yeah. Um, nowadays, 21st century diagnostic techniques, the vast majority of those people, it's going to be stress of one sort or another, or sometimes more than one. So then we go into the, what I call the stress evaluation. Mm -hmm. And it's remarkable, you know, how the, the, that a level of stress capable of making somebody physically ill could be something that the patient is not fully aware of. Um, you know, my favorite example of this was a patient who was hospitalized at a major university on the West Coast four times a year for 15 years with no diagnosis at all. And they even had a psychiatrist see her. But again, <clears throat> most even metal, mental health professionals haven't been taught what to look for when somebody's physically ill. And that psychiatrist missed the diagnosis altogether uh, as well. But you know, I saw her back in the 80s when I was still learning how to do this, but by then I knew what to look for. And it turned out that all of her attacks of illness uh, were connected to her having a, an abusive mother, mostly verbally uh, abusive. And we could connect uh, her attacks of illness with interactions um, with that person. And once she saw that connection, then it became very clear to her, and I can still remember to this day how she looked up at the ceiling and said, oh my God, I can't believe it, when the, the light bulb went on and she finally saw the connection between her illness uh, and this very uh, long-lasting form of stress. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's you know, how it works. We, we look for the stress, uh, and there are several different kinds that we look for, and I can go into the, the details on that if you'd like. Well, um uh, the story that you just mentioned, I believe, is in your book. Is that the story? As yeah, that's, that's actually the one that I led off with because that particular patient was essentially cured in an hour after having been ill for um, off and on for 15 years. So, so this person literally gets up in in, in Ellen's case, as, as you've named her, and walks out, and you've never really seen her again. Or a year later, she's perfectly healthy. Or yeah, actually, she made regular trips to uh, Portland, and she called me a year later to say she'd gone the entire year without having a single attack. And for her, that was remarkable because she had been averaging six to ten attacks uh, every year of you know rather severe symptoms. They put her in the hospital half the time, uh, so it was a, quite a prominent illness. And in her case, just that that revelation of understanding the stress that she had previously not been consciously aware of was enough to bring complete relief, which is, you know, I have to admit, it's unusually fast. A lot of my patients take weeks or months of treatment uh, to get uh, that level of relief. And some people need years of psychotherapy, to be honest. Uh, so there is that other end of the spectrum. Uh, but um, it just shows you what's possible uh, if you know what to look for. So it, Ellen's story, I've read it with great deal of interest and looking at it from a little bit from what I understand from the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And it sounds like because of the verbal and emotional abuse that she was experiencing, um, she had some of the ACE indicators in her life, but it didn't manifest till a number of years later. Is, with, is, is that a fair assessment? Yes, and that happens uh, surprisingly often that people who were mistreated as children who had one or more adverse childhood experiences, um, they may not begin to suffer the symptoms, you know, the long-term impact of that until well into midlife. Now, certainly some of them uh, began experiencing problems when they were still children or adolescents 
or in the early adult years, soon after they leave uh, the family of origin. But other people, they're you know, well into their 30s or even older uh, before the first manifestation. And it took me a long time to understand the process that can do that. You would think somebody who's you know, a decade or two removed from their, uh, let's say, abusive childhood, for example, that they'd be over it. And many of them believe themselves to be over it. And yet there is, a, ironically, it's part of the process of recovery that can reach uh, a sort of a crisis point um, uh, many years uh, into adulthood. And that is when the illness begins. Uh, my very first patient, the very first one, 1983, uh, became ill at the age of 35, very severely ill, baffled two universities in Southern California with uh, uh, no uh, answer to why she was so ill. And I accidentally stumbled on the fact that she'd uh, gone through a very severe um, adverse experience as a child. And I didn't know what to do with that information, but uh, a psychiatrist at UCLA uh, where I was in training, um, I got involved in the care of that patient at, at my request. And within three months, uh, all of the physical symptoms had completely resolved. And that just shocked me. There was nothing in, I'd had seven and a half years of medical education at that point, and nobody had mentioned that such a thing was possible. So I latched on to Dr. Kaplan and, and had her um, begin educating me about what this was all about so that I could apply it to my own patients. And that's, that's really how I got started in this. So, so that was re really your first exposure to it. Where did Dr. Kaplan learn this? I mean, was it through her own experience? Was, was it information that had been passed to her but was not very well known? I mean, there have been um, writing about this condition dating back to probably the first or second century AD. Uh, in terms of understanding that <clears throat> uh, emotions can be responsible for symptoms. Uh, there is even earlier information uh, going back uh, to Egyptian papyri from 1800 BC, uh, Hippocrates, where they were uh, encountering symptoms like this, but didn't really know what to do about it. Um, Galen was the first uh, to really uh, understand that emotions could be involved and certain other writers uh, down through the centuries have um, become aware of this. Dr. Kaplan, I think, was, was trained not only as a psychiatrist, but in internal medicine as well. Uh, so she, she was able to blend uh, those two traditions in a way that uh, few people can. She also had uh, a lot of personal empathy and insight uh, into human beings. And by listening to them could uh, understand things that they were struggling with that the patient themselves uh, might not be aware of. And she she passed on a lot of that uh, uh, skill in what she taught me. Hmm. It, it's, it's fascinating. Like, like I said, I've, I'm kind of a nerd about some of this stuff. And, you know, I've read Stephen Osanich's book and Dr. Saro's book. And I've, I was, when I was reading Stephen Osanich's book, I was like, how is this person even alive? And how could that much of... Uh, stress, et cetera, cause all those problems that he had. And then to be able to recover from that, um, essentially completely. I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is uh, what has gotten me so interested in this field and has kept me going with it. I, I became essentially a, a teaching physician uh, 10 years ago. Um, because it, the kind of story that you just shared, the information you just shared is so compelling. Uh, to to see people who are so ill and and it's it's remarkable the level of illness that this can produce uh, i've had many of my patients who uh, were hospitalized over this uh, one of my patients was a 17 year old girl who was um, i was asked to see her on her 70th hospital day uh, and i was it turned out i was the uh, I was a gastrointestinal consultant for her, and I was number seven that she had seen. She had already been to two universities and, and seen a couple uh, in, in private practice. Uh, uh, she was getting round-the-clock morphine uh, for abdominal pains uh, in doses that are typically uh, reserved for people with advanced cancer, uh, which she most definitely did not have. And yet, you know, by uncovering the stress issues that were going on in her life and intervening successfully 
uh, to turn those around. We got her out of the hospital in a week. She was off of all of the intravenous morphine and just on tablets. And we got her off even the tablets uh, within a month. So, uh, you know, it's that kind of outcome that is just so rewarding as a physician just to be able to turn such substantial levels of disease around just by talking to somebody, just by, you know, having the insight into what's happening in a person's life. Uh, wow. uh, that, you know, my colleagues and I who do this work, um, you know, we're constantly sharing these remarkable stories with each other and, and with the audiences um, of professionals that we teach. Yeah. Uh, it, it's all, like I said, really fascinating. And we, we've exchanged a, a few emails about this. You know, when I was 12, I had a water skiing accident. And I don't know if you knew who Dr. Timothy Campbell was. He was my surgeon, pediatric surgeon. And they removed 60% of my liver, which this was 1971, 21 uh, blood transfusions, cracked ribs, collapsed lung, coma, uh, for 10 days, died, I came back, I was at um, Emanuel Hospital, Goodness. and um, I healed pretty quickly, but I remember saying to my parents, I feel like I've healed from this, but emotionally, I don't feel like I have, and I need some help, and they were happy that I was just alive, right? And so, but then in 86, I started developing atherosclerosis pretty quickly and with no underlying uh, causes for it. My cholesterol, LDL, homocysteine, all those things were normal. And the email that you sent me was about childhood stress can cause inflammation of the arteries. I mean, is something like that potentially a stress illness that came about as a result of this adverse childhood experience? You know, that's a great question, and I wish we had the evidence uh, to give you a solid answer. Uh, sure. There's maybe uh, an indirect clue uh, in a study that was done uh, just in the last couple of years that found that the more ACEs that you had, the more adverse childhood experiences you had in your life, um, the more likely you were to be hospitalized uh, with an autoimmune disease. Um, an autoimmune disease is one in which the body's immune system is attacking the body itself. And mm -hmm. these are things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and multiple sclerosis. And, you know, why in the world should that be? Why should, you know, being treated adversely or growing up in a challenging environment um, result in hospitalization for these diseases many years later? And, one of the speculations is that somehow that adversity turns on the inflammatory system in the body in a way that uh, persists over time. It must persist into the adult years uh, in order for this um, manifestation of autoimmune disease to take place. Mm -hmm. And there's also evidence that the more adversity you suffer, the more um, vascular disease you, you uh, mm -hmm. suffer, the more diabetes, the more cancer. Um, why is that? And it, it may also have to do with turning on the inflammatory system. So we don't, we don't understand all of those connections. We do know that there are connections between um, the brain and the immune system. There was a, a scientist named Robert Ader, A-D-E-R, who died uh, a couple of years ago, who was uh, the one who initially found some of these connections, um, uh, initially in rats, but um, subsequently uh, in human beings. So, um, stress affecting the brain, affecting the immune system seems to be a plausible physiologic uh, pathway uh, that may result in some of these things. And um, I should add for the, um, the uh, evidence aware in your audience that um, these diabetes, cancer, autoimmune, and uh, vascular disease have been uh, statistically controlled for risk factors like smoking and uh, cholesterol and so forth. So it does appear to be an independent impact of the childhood adversity. Hmm. Uh, so it could be that the stress that you suffered as a 12 year old um, uh, in some way was through this link to the uh, inflammatory system uh, was uh, affecting your blood vessels. Um, but well, it's interesting because it, it, for in my case, I really felt like for a number of years, my emotions were suppressed. 
and I, I wasn't very good at expressing them or um, recognizing them. And I think since my recovery from my atherosclerosis that I've really developed that much more. And essentially for the last 30 years, I have not been sick. And that's another area that I wish we had more evidence for. Um, you know, I, I've certainly seen, you know, over 7,000 patients that I've personally treated where we've been able to help them with their, their physical symptoms that were connected to stress. Um, and I've, I've seen some corollary benefits with respect to addictions, um, eating disorders like anorexia or bulimia, uh, cutting behavior. And I mean, when I say addictions, not just to substances, but often to uh, behaviors like work, sex, gambling, shopping, eating. Um, so there are a lot of sort of secondary benefits. Um, does this uh, treatment to reduce a person's uh, most deep stresses, does that also help with their physical health, um, their immune system, their blood vessels, their propensity to diabetes, uh, their um, you know, propensity to lung disease? We don't have that data yet, but uh, it's, it's a fascinating speculation that uh, we may get some evidence to support uh, in years to come. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to mention, and it's one, one of the questions or, or thoughts that I wanted to bring up, I mentioned that I picked up Dr. Sarno's book for the first time in the mid-90s. And I had started yoga in 1987, initially. Um, I was on a cane. And then I, in 1993, I started doing hot yoga, which is what's called Bikram yoga, hot yoga. And I started reading the material, and I was really fascinated, and I started studying with Bikram and Rajasri as teachers in the mid-90s, and I showed and talked to Rajasri about Dr. Sarno's information, and she said that, that she said everything was TMS, and that was the mind part about the yoga. And that if you learn to relax the mind, your body will follow. Is, is there, does that make sense to you as, as a researcher and physician? You know, there's a lot of data about uh, the relaxation response, a lot of data about the health benefits of mindfulness, of meditation, of yoga, you know, all of these techniques that uh, seem to uh, or actually do, you know, bring your stress level down. Mm -hmm. And being able to do that uh, on a regular basis um, clearly has health benefits. And particularly for the uh, population of patients who are suffering from stress-related physical symptoms. And, and, and those symptoms can, again, we should mention, can be from head to toe. Uh, you know, Dr. Sarno was famous for taking care of people with low back pain, but um, honestly, uh, the symptoms can be uh, anywhere, and it's not necessarily even pain. Uh, you know, I, I got into this because of people having gastrointestinal symptoms, so there are non-pain symptoms as well. But yeah, to get back to your original point, uh, these relaxation techniques uh, counteract the uh, activity of the sympathetic nervous system, um, which can be in turn traced to the brain, where there are uh, different circuits in people suffering from these conditions. Than, than healthy people have. Um, yeah. And it's probably those brain circuits in the brain that are being um, turned off by these meditative mindfulness, relaxation, yoga type techniques. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I related back then is I, I was told um, by, by Bikram in class about don't worry about it, forget about it, just do the yoga because I was all stressed out. I wanted him to give me all these corrections. And that idea, don't worry about it, forget about it, was probably the single biggest lesson that, that I've learned in yoga. But what I also learned, going back to Dr. Sarno's material, Dr. Sarno essentially was saying the same thing. Oh, don't worry about it. Just you're going to be okay. Go about your day. So I, I found a, a similar mindset, I guess, or, th or thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, so many people, um, particularly when they're suffering pain uh, in an area of the body that they can voluntarily move, like the spine or like a shoulder or a knee, 
um, they, they are afraid they're going to do damage. Um, and, but when the medical investigation showed that uh, these areas of the body are, are not damaged, um, then the, the next thing you need to do is try to overcome the fear that you're going to be harming yourself. Because um, the, the fear magnifies the pain, and then the pain magnifies the fear, and you get into this uh, vicious cycle. So if you're able to sort of mentally will yourself to dismiss that fear and just resume your, um, your normal daily activities, um, it can go a long way toward uh, eliminating those symptoms, particularly, again, pain in, in parts of the body that move. Now, not everybody responds to that. Not everybody gets better. Some people, the symptoms come back. Sometimes they come back in a different part of the body. Mm -hmm. And for individuals with that experience, we need to go deeper. Uh, we need to find out, you know, what is the stress uh, that's going on? Does it have roots uh, in adverse childhood experiences? Or is it that you, um, you lack self-care skills? Are you the kind of person that's taking care of everybody else in your world, uh, but having difficulty putting yourself on the list of people you take care of? Um, are you suffering from uh, depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress um, that hasn't been addressed yet? We need to, to look for those kind of things, uh, yeah. particularly in people who aren't making good progress. Yeah. So and I, I know what Dr. Sarno, I mean, his, his first thing was about back. And like you said, he came from, from that school and you came more from the gastroenterology side of things. Um, but I know many people who, you know, say, oh, I can't do that because I have a herniated disc or a slipped disc or a pinched nerve and all that. And I'm, I'm pretty careful when I say anything to them, especially if, if they're a student, but recognizing that, oh, here's a clue that, you know, it may not really be an issue. And knowing that there are a number of studies out there that with MRIs that show people that have no problems in their spine can have pain and people that have problems in their spine, the slipped disc, herniated disc, um, et cetera, may not have any pain at all. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a, a big problem in, in back pain world and occasionally in other parts of the body that when you go looking for um, uh, abnormalities, sometimes you're going to find them, but they're, they're not relevant to the symptoms. Uh, and the, the best example of that is in the back pain world where over half the population uh, beyond the age of 40 will have something wrong with their spine if you do an MRI on them, even if they have no symptoms uh, whatsoever. So if you go in to see a, a spine surgeon because of pain and they get an MRI in your back and they find uh, some you know, minor abnormalities and, and you don't have any um, pinched nerve symptoms uh, to go along with it, um, there's an excellent chance that it's actually a, a form of stress that's responsible for your symptoms and, and not the minor abnormalities that are just part of the aging process. Sure, sure. And that's fairly true too in the, the work that you do with gastroenterology as I understand it and from reading your book and, and talking to you today is that they may have these intense abdominal issues or, or pain, symptoms, et cetera, but when you go in and actually take a look, you don't see anything, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Although occasionally, you know, a, a gallstone will turn up and I've seen lots of patients who've had their gallbladders removed and up, lo and behold, the symptoms don't change. And that's because the symptoms weren't really resembling a, a gallbladder attack in the first place. Um, mm. But the surgeon, you know, he, they've got pain in generally the right area. They see a gallstone, they say, well, we better get it out of there. And so they do. Uh, but uh, the majority of the time um, when we go looking for uh, sources of abdominal pain and we don't find anything, we're going to find a stress in that patient's life that can account for the symptoms. Sure. And from a, um, I'm, I don't know the, the right way to ask this, but I, I know that there's, I read things from time to time about microbes and et cetera, and your intestinal tract and all of that. Does some of that get shifted when you're under stress where some of those microbes may be acting up a little bit more, causing some issues or, is there just no change in that environment with the microbes? Yeah, that's an active area of research, uh, what all those microbes 
are doing in there. I think the New York Times just had an article uh, about that in the last couple of days. Uh, and there's a, an entity that's gotten a lot of diagnostic attention called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, where you get a, a, a test where you swallow some carbohydrate and then you see uh, how long it takes for um, certain gases to appear in your breath. Um, the test isn't 100% reliable, let's put it that way. And there's also an issue that a lot of uh, my colleagues in gastroenterology are not aware of, which is that if you are under enough stress, it can actually slow down uh, your GI tract. And if you slow down the GI tract, um, it can allow bacteria to overgrow. So mm -hmm. it, it may be that the bacterial overgrowth is a secondary phenomenon um, to stress-induced uh, slowing of the motility, the contractions of the GI tract. Yeah. And so they, but typically when somebody gets a positive diagnosis of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, all the attention is focused on that. And the possibility that it could be stress uh, involved in that patient's symptoms is ignored, which yeah. is really too bad. Yeah. One, one of the other areas of, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about too was depression and anxiety, because that's mentioned in, in your book as well. And um, how does that affect us? And how does that affect the, the development of stress illness and so on? And, and is there a difference? Yeah, well, these are two conditions that you can get without realizing it you can get the disease we call depression without feeling particularly depressed. Um, and the majority of patients in my practice that were referred with, uh, who actually had depression as the cause of their illness, they would tell me, no, I don't feel depressed. Um, you know, maybe they felt stressed out. They might've felt frustrated or exasperated, but they didn't really have that subjective sense of feeling depressed. And what they were in my office for was a physical symptom that was the manifestation of their depression. But you could diagnose the depression anyway because they had other manifestations of it, including poor sleep, uh, reduced energy level, their appetite was off, they might be crying for no obvious reason, they might have lost interest in things that they used to love to do. And those are all uh, secondary symptoms of depression. And, and when the person's got enough of those, you can reach a very solid conclusion that the disease depression is what they're suffering from. Anxiety disorders are the same way. Most of my patients with an anxiety disorder um, didn't really tell me they had a subjective sense of feeling worried or anxious or fearful. Um, they, they might express that they were feeling a certain amount of stress, but anxiety or fear or worry, uh, not so much. Um, but you could get a, a solid clue that anxiety was responsible for their symptoms when you would learn that um, if they were in a safe place, you know, anywhere they considered uh, a safe place in their world, their symptoms were usually less severe or less frequent. Mm -hmm. um, and whereas if they were out somewhere that they thought was less safe, um, you know, out in the world, out around large numbers of people, um, away from their safe place, um, then the symptoms would start to come on and become more and more uh, significant or frequent uh, the longer they were out there. So that, that was the clue about the anxiety. But these are both very common. They, they form a large percentage of a, uh, the people who come in the door of a primary care practice. Uh, and you have to be aware that um, their main complaint of somebody with depression or anxiety is most likely a physical symptom. Yeah. And one, one of the things in, in your book it talks about, too, is treating that depression um, with medication off, often. And are most of those people then on medication for a longer period of time, or is it a short-term protocol? And are they able to, in many cases, move through that through uh, therapy, counseling, perhaps journaling and writing? Yeah, there are... Um lots of ways to treat depression and everybody is different. Um, yeah. Some people would benefit from uh, short-term medication. I usually would recommend uh, six to nine months, um, but you know, along with uh, other forms of treatment as well to see if we could address any underlying issues that might have been responsible for the depression in the first place and allow the person to wean from the medication uh, after that point. But lots of patients uh, would do just fine without the medication 
and would uh, benefit from the other forms of treatment, uh, whether it be counseling or journaling or um, reading about uh, the factors that can produce depression. Same thing with anxiety. Um, some people were just, their symptoms were so intense um, that they really wanted a medication as a kind of a short-term crutch while they worked on uh, other things. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, happy to, to uh, prescribe that for them. Um, and if they had side effects, you know, try a different one um, for however long was needed uh, until they could, um, you know, get back on their feet and, and be able to make use of the other techniques. Yeah. But the combination of, um, of medication and uh, counseling and journaling and so forth was often uh, more effective than either one alone. Yeah. That, that's interesting, the, the journaling, because I hear about that more and more, and I've journaled for a good part of the last 30 years, and every morning, even today, I get up in the morning and, and I do what I call my gratitude journal, and, and I write things that, that I'm grateful for um, every morning. And, you know, I've heard other, like even like, say, Nicole Sachs, which is a, a big um, advocate of writing and, and even from non-medical sources, people talking about writing and journaling. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that fits into our, perhaps our mental health and our stress? Yeah, it, um, it, it was um, a technique that I used uh, a great deal in my practice, um, particularly with the patients who had survived adversity when they were children. Um, a lot of those physical symptoms that they suffered were um, bodily manifestations of emotions that they had uh, inside about those early experiences. And I would first try to connect them uh, with those emotions by asking them to imagine a child growing up exactly as they did, uh, growing up experiencing everything that they did as a child, you know, perhaps their own child, perhaps another child that they cared about. And that helped them to appreciate more accurately exactly how much they went through. By, you know, imagining it happening to yourself, you may not get the full impact as if you imagine an innocent child trying to cope with the same issues. And then once you've made that connection, then to write about it, then to uh, write in a journal, um, you write every day, write you know, all in one sitting, um, either way. Um, and another technique was to write a letter uh, to the person or persons who mistreated you as a child, not to mail it, just to write it, to get a chance to put your thoughts and feelings uh, down on a piece of paper or typed into a keyboard, uh, to try to convert them from being expressed via your body into being expressed uh, onto a page. And I found that the more people could do that, um, the less their body uh, took the impact. Mm -hmm. I, I also, in your book, you mentioned about that importance of the self-care and for taking time for yourself every week. And you talked about five hours of self-care, not broken up, but five hours at one particular time. Yeah, I found through trial and error that uh, taking an afternoon a week, if you possibly could, and here, you know, it's not possible for everybody to do that. Some people, you know, could only manage an hour a week, but every little bit helps. And the, the concept there is to put yourself on the list of people that you take care of. Um, so many of my patients grew up in environments where they were taking care of everybody else. Uh, one of my patients was managing the family checkbook uh, for her two alcoholic parents starting at the age of seven. You know, wow. th this was somebody who emerged into adulthood without the ability to put herself on the list of people she was taking care of. So she was, you know, fixing everybody's problems in her world. And you ask her, you know, what do you do for fun for yourself? And it was like, didn't really have an answer to that. So it's a skill. It's a necessary, essential human skill to be able to put yourself on the list of people you take care of, go out there and do something with no purpose, but its own joy. Um, something that's the moral equivalent of finger paints for a four-year-old. Um, and once you learn how to do that, then it's a skill you have for the rest of your life. But it takes time. It, you know, most of my patients took months of taking that afternoon a week to, to learn it, to get over the guilt when they first start doing it. Um, 
and to just explore, to do trial and error, to find things that are fun. Um, but once again, well, again, once they learn how to do that, then it's a skill they have for the rest of their lives. Yeah. One, one of the things that um, I look at with, with all of this, most of this work, unlike um, the stress illness or even TMS, is all really reacting to a lack of a better term, reacting to a problem that's happened and then trying to fix it, maybe not in the traditional methods, but through the understanding of, of the stress and the, the TMS factors, et cetera, versus what if somebody has all these stresses in life, hasn't manifested anything yet, how can they live a life without manifesting all this stuff? without having it to be reactive, that we're more proactive in our lives. And is that just that coming back to a lot of that self-care? You know, I, I think that's a big part of it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, gratitude, as you mentioned, um, is a big part of it. Um, Self-esteem is a huge piece of a person's resiliency. You know, there's a lot that's been written about, you know, how do we make people resilient to the stresses that, life is inevitably going to throw at us. And the story that I heard over and over again from my patients, you know, many of whom went through terrible uh, adversity, was that if there was one person that believed in them, you know, one person that made them feel valuable, um, that that made all the difference in the world. And if you didn't have that, um, you know, you can try to be your own best friend. You can try to be um, the person that um, where you persuade yourself um, that that you have value that you know human beings are we're, we're learning creatures I mean what what distinguishes humanity from other species on the planet is our capacity for learning and the most important subject we learn about is ourselves and if we grow up in a dysfunctional or adverse environment one of the things we're going to learn is that we, we don't measure up uh, we're not as good as other people, um, or that we have to be constantly vigilant, or that, that danger can appear from anywhere at any time. And it's important for us, if we've grown up in that kind of environment, to unlearn that mm -hmm. and to uh, look at ourselves as heroic. You know, if we grew up in adversity, uh, overcoming that um, is, a, is a hero's journey. Um, a hero in our society is somebody who's overcome a difficult physical or mental challenge for a good cause. And my, my patients who've overcome childhood adversity, they've done exactly that. And if they can think of themselves as having been born on the far side of Mount Everest and they, they've climbed up and over to get to be an adult, um, that's uh, a huge shift in their self-image. And uh, if they can get to that, that place uh, in, in how they look at themselves, uh, it makes all the difference. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I, I know you go more into that, too, in the book and even writing the hero and putting it on your mirror and, and all of that. And it was just like my, my feeling when I was reading that was just like right on, Dr. Clark. You know, it was, I liked it. Yeah. And it's um, uh, so many of my patients struggle with that idea that, that you know, they've, they've been taught in so many ways um, that they were second rate human beings and it, that it became a, a fundamental assumption uh, of their lives. And, you know, it's simply not true. It's a big lie. Um, they, they actually, the, it's, it's a big lie because the opposite is true, that they had to endure all that. Um, they are actually like uh, Olympic champions of carrying stress around, um, that they've got, you know, 400 pounds of stress on their shoulders that they don't know is there. Uh, until they're finally able to put that down. And then they see their strength. You know, they see exactly what it took uh, to come through that. Um, one of my patients, her parents divorced when she was eight years old, and, uh, but they continued to live in the same house. Uh, they slept in separate bedrooms, but they lived in the same house. And there was daily mutual hostility between them. It was just a horrendous environment. Uh, and it was only when she finally saw just how much she had uh, had to cope with um, that she could look at herself as, you know, wow, what, you know, what a little kid she must have been to have dealt with that for so many years. Yeah. Um, and that, that 
a 180 degree flip in her self image made an enormous difference in the rest of her life. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting closer to the, the end of our time. I did want to talk about two things, and especially since you just mentioned uh, your, your patient right then, but I wanted to mention this, the story about Joaquin in your book, as well as uh, the PPDA. So I was really fascinated by Joaquin and moving from California to Oregon and growing up in, in an extremely dysfunctional and abusive family and helping this young man uh, perhaps come out of that particular situation because of his anger and his fear. Can you mention Joaquin a little bit? Yeah, you bet. He was a 16-year-old uh, who um, was referred for abdominal pains that had been going on for months, and he'd seen a variety of clinicians. Um, he himself thought that uh, stress might be involved, but nobody had been able to, uh, to figure it out. Uh, so I, we got around to one of the basic questions that I asked people as part of my evaluation, which was, did anything stressful happen to you right before your illness began? Nobody had asked him that um, up to that point. And sure enough, it turned out that right before his illness began, he had gone back to California to visit his dad. You know, his parents had divorced. Um, and he hadn't heard from his dad in six years, not so much as a, you know, a birthday card. Uh, but he'd heard through the grapevine that uh, the uh, dad might have Im improved himself from the you know, violent drug abusing alcoholic uh, that he was when his parents were married. So he thought, you know, maybe there's some hope for reconciliation here. Make a long story short, things didn't go well. His dad wasn't that happy to see him. He offered him alcohol and drugs, but that was about it. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, this poor man was, you know, young man was very disappointed by that and just, you know, enraged that, you know, he, he had come all that way and, and only to be rejected. So he stole his father's pickup truck and drove it down one of the LA freeways at 50 miles an hour in second gear, and then drove it down the off ramp and shifted into reverse while he was still going about 50 miles an hour. And he proceeded to do that another dozen times until he ruined the transmission, um, brought the now very noisy vehicle back to his father's place, had a big shouting match, and he came back to Oregon on the bus, um, just, you know, seething with anger and, and turmoil. And that's when his stomach pain started. Um, but we were able to help him understand the connection um, between this experience and his physical symptoms, um, able to under, help him understand the uh, emotions that he was having with respect to his dad. He wasn't so good at writing, so we had him speak into a recording device to, to get his thoughts, you know, verbalized so that those emotions would be going into the recording device instead of into his uh, abdomen. And, you know, he did very well, um, but it, it was a, uh, um, uh, just an absolutely classic case of somebody whose situation can be turned around quickly uh, if you know what to look for. And you mentioned the PPDA. Um, it's a wonderful organization that is a collection of people that do this kind of work. Um, and we all, you know, talk to each other and communicate with each other and we, um, educate the public uh, as well as healthcare professionals. Um, the website being ppdassociation.org. Mm -hmm. And so, this, so that's an organization that you're president of, and that, that you formed. Is that correct? Um, myself, along with a number of other experts from around the country. Yes. Yeah. And is that your main emphasis today? Is educating other health professionals as well as patients and other people on stress illness? Yes, I go um, all over the United States, uh, Canada, Europe. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in this now, I think especially because of the opioid epidemic. Uh, people are looking for an alternative to prescribing opioids uh, for chronic pain. And this is a very viable option. There's a growing amount of research uh, the PPDA, in fact, uh, sponsored a uh, big research trial uh, of patients with chronic back pain using our particular methods of counseling and comparing it with two control groups. And we're looking forward to that study uh, that we funded in part uh, being published later this year. Wow. And so are, are you finding that uh, physicians are pretty open to th this idea or is there still some of that resistance that maybe Dr. Sarno talked about? 
You know, there was resistance uh, when I first began speaking about this in the 1980s, but every year that's gone by, the resistance is less, the acceptance is greater. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, fairly uh, good-sized primary care practice near Albany, New York, where they have adopted these methods uh, um, in a big way, let's put it that way. And it has just transformed their practice. Um, they, you know, I've, I've done a couple of presentations uh, with them at national meetings. And, uh, you know, once our presentation is over, they still can't stop talking about their cases. And it has given them such joy in their practice. These patients with this kind of problem, like, like Joaquin that we just talked about, very frustrating uh, for physicians because they don't know what to do. And once they learn what to look for, once they learn what to ask about, um, all of a sudden, patients who are very, very frustrating become very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives a lot of joy back uh, into medical practice. Yeah. Well, uh, Dave, Dr. Clark, I, I know that we could probably talk for hours on end about this stuff. And I look forward, I, I know that you, you have a series of videos coming out because I watched the first module uh, the other day. And um, those are, you've got 12 of those coming out, is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's modular. So uh, a number of my colleagues are, who do this work are already um, uh, proposing additional modules to uh, add into it. So it's going to start with a dozen or so and going to grow from there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, watching all of them and, you know, taking my inner nerd and, and learning um, more about it. Do you, are you planning another book by any chance? Um, I am working with uh, a group of uh, experts from around the world on writing a textbook, but I am ins insisting that they not put a bunch of jargon in it. And so far they are complying with that because we want the medical people to be able to read the mental health uh, chapters and, we want, and vice versa which means that you, if you're medical, you can't put your jargon in it or the mental health people won't be able to understand it and vice versa. So we're going to try to strip out all the jargon and have people write their chapters in English. Uh, and that means that even the public uh, will be able to read it. So we're hoping to get that published in 2019. That's great. I, I, I look forward to that. I'm sure I, I would dive right into it and you know, I, I appreciate your time again. I know that you're a, a busy man and a lot of demands on your time. And um, how do you take care of yourself? Do you take your five hours a week? Uh, oh, I, I do more than that. Uh, probably the, my personal best is uh, playing with my grandchildren because uh, they are just a delight and a joy. And I'm, I'm blessed with uh, five of them ranging in age from one to nine. And uh, that is a huge personal stress reduction for me. Yeah, well, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Clark. Again, to get his book, They Can't Find Anything Wrong, um, there will be a, a link here on the website at Falling Up Radio, or you can get it at Amazon. Um, can they get it through the PPDA, or is it basically Amazon? Yeah, it's pretty much Amazon uh, right now because it's, it's been out there for 10 years and it's perpetually in the top couple percent on Amazon. So I've been pleased about that. Yeah, great. And all, all the listeners out there today, I really invite you to, to click on the links on this page, whether it's the PPDAassociation.org, to subscribe to the YouTube site, to, to watch all the different videos, but really to dive in. And I know in the PPDA site, there's a lot of resources on there to learn more about this. And it might be that you find something that, that might be able to help you or, or maybe a, a loved one that's um, dealing with some type of illness that is, that is somewhat unexplained or maybe has some explanation and then the stress is also affecting it. So um, again, they can't find anything wrong. Dr. Clark, again, really thank you for uh, being here. I appreciate all your time and Perhaps when your, your next book comes out, um, we can have you back on and talk about it some more. It'd be a pleasure, Michael. Uh, I would look forward to it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dave.